I love Chipotle burritos. And if any of you are like me, you understand the inevitable feeling of the food baby after you eat that entire burrito. That being said, I'm always thinking that the next day I really need to go for a long run in order to burn off all of that food that I just ate. Because of this, last spring semester I was interested in conducting a research study in order to see if there is in fact a relationship between one's diet and their participation in physical activity the following day. I hypothesized that after consumption of a meal, either in low nutritional value or high energy, subjects would be more likely to engage in physical activity the following day, but only if they were at a normal weight. I hypothesized that subjects who are either overweight or obese would be less likely to engage in physical activity the following day after consuming a meal in low nutritional value. As a kinesiology graduate from Penn State University, who would like to one day become a physician assistant, I find many of the statistics from the Centers for Disease Control alarming, especially one that states over two-thirds of American adults are either classified as overweight or obese, including 73.1% of men and 60.2% of women. In addition, only 20.6% of American adults are engaging in the recommended amounts of physical activity and are also only consuming 1.6 servings of fruits or vegetables when my plate doc of recommends that we consume at least 4 to 5 servings per day. Because of these very, very bad statistics, the U.S. spends over $254 billion treating these preventable diseases, which could be otherwise eliminated if Americans were to engage in the proper amounts of physical activity and consume well-balanced nutritional diets. So during this talk, I would first like to give you a brief discussion about previous literature that has looked at the correlation between diet and physical activity, as well as how I ran my own study, and I will finish up by giving you the results from my study and some of the discussion points that I found. However, the problem is that there is very limited previous literature on the correlation between diet and physical activity. I did find one study, though, by McFerrin and McHope Adopavi that examined how people's views about diet and physical activity influence their participation in exercise and the type of meals they consume. It was found that people who believed physical activity was the most important indicator for a good healthy weight were actually more likely to be overweight or obese. In comparison to those subjects, who believe nutrition to be the better indicator of a good and healthy weight. Those who thought nutrition was the best factor influencing one's weight were actually more likely to be at a normal weight. Two other studies by Gooden in 2010 and Duval et al. in 2008 showed that eating frequency and energy, expender, energy expenditure tend to be related. According to Gooden, as children increase their energy expenditure, they were also more likely to increase their energy intakes. Which makes sense, because as the body burns more calories, more calories are demanded by the body in order to replace the energy expended. In Duval et al. study, his research was similar to Guten's and showed that people with higher energy intakes, when paired with a physically active lifestyle, were more likely to have a lower body mass index. A final study conducted by Caldwell et al. in 2008 was similar to Guten and Duval et al.'s studies and showed that as people increased their levels of physical activity, they were actually more likely to decrease the amount of high fats consumed in their diets. So in order to see if my study was, would provide the same results as these previous studies, I first recruited 30 college-age students from Penn State 15 males and 15 females, to participate in a five-day food and exercise journal, which I have right here. This is the food journal, and this was the exercise journal they completed. 
Nine of the male subjects were classified as either overweight or obese, and seven of the female subjects were classified as overweight or obese. These subjects were used as the control in order to compare their diets and physical activity habits to those of the normal weight subjects. The food and exercise journals ran over a five-day period, and the food journals started on Thursday and ran to the following Monday, while the exercise journals went from Friday to the following Tuesday. This was done in order to stagger the journals to determine if there was a correlation between diet and physical activity the following day. For the food journal, the subjects were required to record all foods and beverages they consumed, including their serving sizes, without including the consumption of alcohol. For the exercise journals, they were to record the minutes and or hours they spent engaged in either moderate or vigorous physical activity, and examples were provided for each type of exercise. However, the exercise only counted if it was in a session of at least 10 minutes or longer, and the food journal was a modified version of the International Physical Activity Questionnaire. All the journals were returned in similar envelopes in order to maintain each individual's anonymity so that no one else knew who they were and they were more likely to provide real results instead of biased results. The subjects' diets were either recorded as good, poor, or moderate based on the servings and the types of food they ate from myplate.gov. And they were also classified as either active or sedentary, whether they received and participated in the correct amounts of physical activity recommended by the Centers for Disease Control. So my data was a little inconclusive. I didn't find any direct correlations between diet and physical activity. However, I was able to connect my results with those from some of the previous literature. I did find one surprising statistic that stated 70% of individuals in my study, mostly women and overweight subjects, were receiving the correct amounts of physical activity, which was very surprising because according to the Centers for Disease Control, only 20.6% of Americans actually engage in the recommended amounts of exercise. This may be because which shown by a study from Walsh, Hunter, Sarah Cole, and Gower in 2004, stated that 49% of overweight women tended to overestimate the amounts of physical activity they participated in in comparison to normal weight women when using subjective versus objective measures, which is what I believe happened in my study due to the fact that my subjects were doing subjective measure, measures versus objective measures. Additionally, in comparison to the normal weight subjects, the overweight or obese subjects had zero of the participants maintaining a good diet. Most of the overweight and obese subjects either had a moderate or a poor diet, with the majority having a poor diet. And this supported the findings from McFerrin and McHopa DeVee, which stated that people who believe nutrition to be the most important factor in determining healthy weight actually had lower BMIs. However, my findings were different from Guten's and Duval's at all, in that as energy expenditure increased, energy intake also increased, but resulted in subjects with lower BMIs. My subjects, as both energy intake and energy expenditure increased, tended to be the overweight or obese individuals. I think a lot of these inconclusive um, data may have occurred because alcohol consumption was not included in my subject or was not included in my study, and I also use subjective versus objective measures. Although no correlation was found, my research was able to add to some of the previous literature and also to determine that more research does in fact need to be done because we have such inconclusive results. 
It's important to determine what is causing the overweight and obesity epidemic in our society because it is such a costly problem and relates to pretty much everyone, seeing as how over two-thirds of the population are suffering from these preventable diseases. The best way to treat these diseases is to find what is causing them and prevent them at an early age before it continues this epidemic that is happening. Therefore, I would like to leave you with a quote from Hippocrates that states, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little and not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. Thank you.